Hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Xu Qingdu. Global geopolitics is undergoing profound changes. The Ukraine crisis is nowhere near an end. Europe is struggling with an energy crisis, and Russia is looking east for its oil exports. The U.S., in a bid to contain China, is making moves that are unsettling its own allies. With so many uncertainties around the world, what can we expect from 2023? How is geopolitics fundamentally changing the global trade map? And what should China do to turn challenges into opportunities? To answer these questions, earlier I talked to Emmanuel Daniel, founder of the Asian Bank, and Professor Zhang Gong with the University of International Business and Economics. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qingduo. Well, welcome to the discussion. Uh, well, Daniel, I will start with you. With aid and new tanks now on the way to Ukraine, some experts say this conflict could extend uh, probably many years. You know, what do you think? You know, are we seeing only the beginning of a long protracted conflict? Or are there prospects for some kind of negotiated solution in the short run? I ask this question because uh, this is uh, having an uh, economic impact globally, right? You know, uh, Chinto, when I think about the Ukraine war, I look back at all the previous wars that have been um, and whether, you know, what were the factors that made them get protected. Uh, I think that uh, this stands a very good chance of being protected uh, because um, it's not just a uh, economic war uh, or a territorial war. Uh, it's also, um, you know, a conceptual war uh, between different ideological groups. Uh, and it's just a question of how long can they afford uh, to have this long, uh, this war protracted uh, into the future. Um, you know, and, and over time, uh, we will see alliances created uh, on both sides of, of this conflict. Uh, and I think that's where the story is. Mm -hmm. uh, so, John, this conflict obviously is beyond Ukraine and Russia. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, Russia has been saying that it's actually fighting against the entire NATO alliance. So, uh, you know, I, I see this as a war between Russia and an entire NATO as well. You know, you're seeing um, uh, American and, and NATO involvement in terms of providing arms, providing, you know, tanks, all kinds of weapons. And I think probably most, more importantly, you know, also in areas of uh, collaboration, intelligence gathering, you know, sharing satellite photos. These things are very vital for fighting a war, and it's very clear to me, you know, this is going to be a war that's going to be protracted for a very long time. Uh, it reminds me of the, the Korean War, for example, um, and uh, I don't see any ending inside anytime soon. Um, unfortunately, you know, even though American GI is not fighting on the battleground, uh, but both the European side and the American side, the treasuries are bleeding. I mean, we're talking about a couple of billion dollars a month. Um, and, and from Americans' perspective, from Washington's perspective, this is going to be another forever war. You know, we know that Afghanistan is a forever war. This is another forever war. Just, you know, such a short time after uh, the wrapping up things in Afghanistan. Um, so, um, uh, you know, it's just a... Uh, it's a very unfortunate situation. Uh, Ukrainians are dying, Russians are dying, um, but um, um, no ending in sight anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's a war that started in the 1990s. Uh, I, I put my finger, you know, in, from that period because it was a process that got escalated over time. Uh, and at the point of, of the war starting last year, it was a territorial war. But look at the repercussions of the war in terms of the different geopolitical groups that have create, have uh, generated because of this war, uh, you know, and, and uh, the geopolitical uh, issues that it, it has created today on every front, on oil, uh, on trade, and, and so on. Yeah, uh, that's right, Daniel. If you look at the impact, you know, one uh, sector probably is the energy uh, issue, obviously, because Russia is a superpower in that sense, in terms of uh, the supply of oil and gas. Uh, European countries, uh, you know, partly because of their sanctions on Russia, so they are cutting relationship in that respect. They are, you know, finding replacement from other countries. And for the majority of the developing countries, you know, uh, they could find it really hard to access the oil uh, from Russia uh, and the gas from Russia. How will the map of the global energy change because of the conflict? The ongoing, probably it will continue for some years to come. 
One number that I that caught my attention was the IMF uh, uh, report, the outlook that was just published uh, a couple of weeks ago. The IMF uh, concluded, uh, you know, for this period at least, uh, that the Russian economy will actually uh, grow by 0.3 percent, uh, you know, in, for the rest of the year. Um, now, what that means is that the IMF has taken into account uh, the the positive impact that the oil prices are having on the Russian economy for the short term. Okay, um, and what it also means is that. Uh, the oil inventories around the world are being taken into account, where the oil is, uh, who's paying for it, uh, and what the, what the impact is on, on their respective economies. Um, I think that uh, that's a changing playing field. Uh, uh, Russia cannot continue to you know, benefit from uh, the oil dividend for the long term, um, but uh, it has a knock-on effect. Uh, the supply chain in which uh, uh, the, the, the users of the, the, the importing nations and the exporting nations and the relationships between, between them uh, is changing dramatically at the moment. Uh, a second um, effect of uh, this war and, uh, and on, on energy uh, is the rise of LNG. Uh, very interestingly, I think I've, I've seen that the numbers, uh, LNG exports have risen 137% last year. Uh, so. Uh, what you're seeing now is the rise of mid-sized countries that are geopolitically important uh, and there may be tensions taking place and these are countries like Azerbaijan, uh, like Algeria uh, and so on, uh, which uh, may not you know, affect, figure in, in the global geo geopolitical map, but at the regional level they are also players. Uh, so I see these tensions uh, changing uh, as a result of uh, what's happening on the energy front. Mm -hmm. uh, Daniel, are you saying that uh, you know, energy is becoming, let's say, is playing a more important role? Uh, because if you look at the European countries, you know, uh, they are struggling to replace their imports from Russia uh, of oil and gas from, you know, from other countries, uh, such as African countries or, or countries in the Middle East. Uh, that's right. So that's you know. Do you see their efforts uh, paying off? You know, are you seeing their you know that kind of effects on the European economy uh, being stable or coming stable? Well, the it's you know the the cards the chess are being um, you know uh, are being played around on the deck right now, meaning that uh, you know the European countries are trying to figure out how to reduce their dependence on Russia. Uh, so, therefore, the LNG part of the equation is becoming more dominant. Uh, at the same time, uh, there are countries like India uh, which are, and China, of course, but which are making you know, bilateral deals uh, with Russia, with Saudi Arabia and so on. Um, and, and bilateral type of relationships are becoming more amiable today. Like, for example, the relationship between Saudi Arabia and China and uh, the willingness of Saudi Arabia to, uh, you know, to sell oil on renminbi. Uh, you know, the trade between Saudi Arabia and China is sufficient enough uh, for them to have enough liquidity uh, in a renminbi relationship rather than uh, the traditional petrodollar. So, you know, there's so much happening on every front on that, in, in, on that basis. Uh, indeed, John, uh, if you look at, of course, China's relationship with uh, Saudi Arabia, for example, and also, you know, India's uh, purchase of oil and gas from Russia. Uh, and Russia's, uh, you know, the Russia is basically pivoting away from European countries, which are, I mean, used to be uh, the major partner, trade partner of Russia. Russia is turning to Asia uh, and, and also, Af you know, uh, African countries and also Latin American countries. Well, Russia has to. Uh, it, it has to find a place to sell its energy products. And uh, India and China, I think, are strong enough to stand up against uh, the sanctioning bloc to say, look, you know, we take a neutrality position. Uh, we are maintaining a normal trade relationship with Russia. The fact of doing that doesn't mean we take a position on this war. Uh, and we'll continue to buy oil uh, from Russia. <clears throat> I think these are the you know, strong positions taken by these two countries. And obviously, um, in a way, I think they're also benefiting from this because you know, Russia is selling this oil at a little bit of a discount compared to the world prices. Um, so so the, the entire energy market uh, landscape, in my view, is becoming bifurcated, basically. You know, there, there's, a, there's a market that's participated on buy side by, by the European Union, by, by other developed countries, uh, but there's also a sort of a separate market which 
has a sole supplier, <laughs> you know, which called uh, Russia. Um, and and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, it's a there's a war going on, and uh, you know, uh, China is not joining like India, uh, like other uh, countries in the BRIC uh, bloc, for example. Uh, we are maintaining a relationship with Russia as usual, uh, in, a, a commercial relationship, of course, uh, and, and, and we're not going to be shy about that. Uh, I yeah. think um, so. Uh, you know that that's happening, and uh, I don't think we have to defend on that. Uh, you know, the Washington has their own words about, you know, calling this signing with Russia. That's total nonsense, and I don't think that. Um, I think uh, maintaining a, um, a, a, a neutrality position has historical precedence, um, and uh, um, you know, there's nothing more to run in my view. Um, and I think uh, it's also working very well uh, in China's national interest. Mm -hmm. Daniel, go ahead. Yeah, when you know when the EU um, president and and you know the various politicians tell China and India you should not be buying from Russia, uh, it's a battle. It's an ideological battle between uh, the rising the rise of Asia and and the Western mindset. And what Asia is saying to the Western mindset is, uh, we totally um, you know subscribe to um, your concerns about war itself, uh, but we have mouths to speak to feed. Um, you know, we have our own considerations to take into account. And uh, it's not like uh, the decisions made in the Eurozone right now, um, you know, is, uh, and the rise in oil prices as a result, uh, you know, does not have a knock-on effect uh, on other countries, uh, on developing countries and, and large countries like China and India. So I think that the pushback to an ideological domination of the West that's also something that is, um, you know, taking shape right now. And I, I see, uh, you know, countries like China uh, having to build its own message uh, in terms of why it has to do what it has to do. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting development over there. Uh, John, you're speaking of a uh, bifurcation of the energy market. Uh, of course, we know there is this uh, OPEC plus, uh, you know, oil exporting countries group uh, there. Uh, we know uh, bec maybe partly because Russia, you know, still retain or increase its influence in the OPEC plus fossil fuel alliance. Um, U.S. is not happy with uh, with this uh, group, partly because you know U.S. would love them to uh, uh, increase right the export of oil and gas to help fight inflation. And also we know that the U.S. unhappiness with Saudi Arabia, etc. Uh, what do you make of all those? Uh, in episodes uh, and also their impact, probably potential impact on this global uh, geo economy or geo uh, political uh, map. Yeah, Washington, of course, is not happy. As long as the oil price is still high, that means that uh, you know Russia's economy is still going. It can still sell oil at a you know very reasonable price. Uh, so that means there's still oil revenue for Russia. Uh, Washington is not happy. But if you think in the shoes of these oil producing countries, of course, it's in their interest to see a. Uh, oil price that's a little bit higher, right? I mean, the, 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 the whole purpose of OPEC, that's the world's uh, only, in my view, legally, uh, 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 legal uh, uh, cartel, basically, uh, immune from uh, antitrust actions. It's a sovereign uh, action. Um, it, 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 the whole purpose is to maintain oil price high. Um, so, so from that perspective, definitely, uh, they like to see a oil price, you know, maybe close to $100 a barrel, um, and, and they call it uh, uh, stabilizing the world oil prices. Um, uh, that's okay. I think um, you know these countries have, have their interests. Um, they like to see, uh, you know, from from the oil price perspective, they are in the same shoes as the Russians, actually, right? So um, you know, naturally, they would like to uh, stabilize the oil price at a you know fairly high price. So um, you know, we were seeing what happened when Joe Biden went to Saudi Arabia. Uh, you know. People over there are not listening to him. So, uh, and I don't think there's much they can do about it. I mean, Washington can do it about it. So, so I, my guess is that um, it's going to be a trade-off. Essentially, a trade-off on one side. You know, we don't want to see. Um, they, they don't want to see you know oil price too much depressed. On the other hand, uh, you know Washington, and other, other oil consumption countries also don't want to see an oil price that's too high. So, so it's going to be a trade-off, and it's going to be a trade-off for some quite some time, in my view. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, you know we're going to see an oil price uh, 
at the current level. Um, you know, we're, actually, Europe is very lucky because it had a uh, fairly uh, warm winter this time. Otherwise, I think oil prices would be much, much higher. Uh, but at this point, I think you know, it's, a, it's a price level that it's, it's fairly acceptable to China. Uh, and also, um, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a temporary equilibrium in my view, and uh, probably the situation is going to uh, continue for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, Actually, well, this, yeah, this yeah. whole process is changing OPEC as well. Uh, we need to take into account the fact that the U.S. is becoming an oil-producing country in its own right. It's you know, rehabilitating its shale programs and so on. Um, and what it looks like, uh, and in the old days, um, you know, the OPEC agenda was simply keep prices as high as possible, but not so high as to slow down economic growth, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and then uh, fluctuate it that way. But today, uh, because of the desire to move away from, uh, from the petrodollar, for example, uh, and from a West-dominated um, you know, oil um, ecosystem, um, OPEC countries are starting to make bilateral um, deals on their, on, on their own. So you have large consuming countries like China, Japan, uh, and so on, and, and, and India, and South Africa, and so on. Um, you know, and the deals made are uh, uh, bilateral, uh, you know, and I think I can see uh, a multilateral world uh, coming through uh, f as this process works, works its way through. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, speak of the geopolitics, we see that, uh, you know, in addition to the Ukraine conflict, mm -hmm. uh, the U.S. basically is launching a new Cold War against China, you know, uh, for example, decoupling efforts, at least in the high-tech sector. Mm -hmm. uh, John, how do you see the, you know, the long-term effects probably, uh, both on the relationship between China and the U.S. and also on the, on the Chinese development in terms of the high-tech sector. Yeah, Chintua, you used the word Cold War. Actually, I totally agree with you. It's becoming like a Cold War, <laughs> even though well, Joe Biden denied that it's not a Cold War. I think uh, it, the facto way it is already mm -hmm. is. Um, mm -hmm. But nevertheless, it's okay. I think at least you know, both sides are talking about establishing you know, guardrails. That means that uh, to try to you know, prevent things from uh, running out of control, you know, that's at least a good sign. Um, but I think uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, this competition means that uh, um, you know, China can no longer rely on any uh, technologies. I, I wouldn't even say other than just high technologies. Even normal technologies probably are going to be subject to a lot of control from Washington. Just, 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 that's just a fact of life, I guess. So, you know, from now on, I think Chinese companies need to rely on their own and prepare for the worst. Right now, the Chinese government is actually filing a suit at WTO. The issue is precisely about this thing. Mm -hmm. In the in the GATT agreement, there's something called Article 21. It's called National Security Exemption. So, in other words, you know, you should not use the National Security Exemption. Uh, as an excuse for imposing restrictions on trade of other goods. And in, in that article, the, the, um, the, the phrase they use, it's called, uh, uh, it's called the uh, essential security concern. So the essential security concern refers only to military and defense uh, uh, matters. Kind of emergency or crisis, right. right? But today, you know, I, I use the phrase adulteration of the international, <laughs> the national security concept. A lot of things are lumped into this. Um, uh, for example, uh, economic sovereignty, for example, right? Uh, uh, economic competitiveness, mm -hmm. uh, uh, all kinds of things. Uh, uh, corruption, um, uh, cyber security, you know, all kinds of things are lumped together into this, into this national security umbrella. And I think the United States is setting a very uh, um, bad example here. You know, if every country follows their path, um, there will be no WTO, right? So Article 21 is going to be totally abused, in my view. That's a heavy blow to globalization, Daniel. Well, you know, the two acts in the U.S., the CHIP Act uh, and the Inflation Reduction Act, right, they're both um, designed to pass on subsidies. Uh, and the subsidies um, mindset never worked in the U.S. Um, you know, one part of the, you know, of these laws coming into effect uh, is to block out China, of course. But the other part is to attract um, investments and, and infrastructure back into the U.S. Um, and they do that uh, through, su through subsidies. 
Uh, and the U.S. is just not a country that, um, you know, that succeeded or made breakthroughs uh, or, you know, built uh, incredible industries uh, through subsidies. So all of the main players who are in the U.S. at the moment, uh, they're just uh, figuring out how to benefit from the $50 billion, you know, chip subsidy and then do whatever they can and, and then still figure out, um, you know, how they want to, you know, uh, play their own game. Uh, these are world leaders in, you know, in, in all of these industries. In chip being the most important of them. Uh, and the other thing about uh, high technology uh, is that if you look at any high technology, take you know the Boeing 777, for example, it's built in 16 different countries. You know, and when you look at the chip technology industry, um, you know, the design is done in uh, Silicon Valley in the morning. Uh, and then when they go to bed, uh, the Japanese take over, uh, you know, the Koreans, the Chinese, uh, uh, down to Singapore, then to Europe and back to the U.S. Uh, it's a global industry. Uh, you know, when we think about uh, geopolitics, it's very important uh, to come to a realization that technology is not... Uh, harnessed by boundaries or borders. It's global. So even as China, uh, you know, reacts against uh, what the U.S. is doing right now, uh, it has to start thinking uh, about its own role uh, and its own game plan in building a global uh, supply chain and a global intellectual supply chain. Mm -hmm. uh, global supply chain. Uh, you know, John, I, I, earlier I used you know, the Cold War because uh, I talked to uh, uh, John Mears Hammer. I asked him, you know, uh, Joe Biden said that oh, I'm not seeking conflict with China, I'm not seeking a new Cold War with China. Mm -hmm. But if you look at his policy, it's all about a new Cold War. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, now people are talking about the U.S. possible limit on investment in China. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, with that being said, also, uh, Daniel mentioned about this Inflation Reduction Act, mm -hmm. which is everything, mm -hmm. but nothing about the inflation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> it is not only about the, you know against China or attracting investment in back to the U.S., mm -hmm. but also the Europeans are very much concerned about that act. Mm -hmm. Why? Tell us. Well, it's all about about uh, industrial policy and state aid. What's called state aid and state subsidies. I mean, in this uh, in the act you have mentioned, it blatantly has clauses about buying America, for example, right? So that's uh, totally against the spirit of fair competition, uh, the, the the concept of uh, uh, competitive. What's called Competitive neutrality, um, and it's a it's, a, it's a, an issue of a principle. I mean, the uh, the European side holds a very strong view that the, um, you know these are against the spirit of the WTO, against the the competition policy, um, and uh, you know uh, the Mar uh, European companies are uh, essentially shut out of the procurement process by Washington, and that's not fair. Um, it, it, historically, you know, we had this long lawsuit litigation between uh, United States and European Union about airplanes, you know, mm -hmm. Boeing, you know, Airbus. Yeah. It's a classic example of providing state aid by the government. Right. And um, um, the United States is now um, at one side is criticizing China, all of these things. At the same time, it's copied exactly uh, what we used to do, actually. Um, so um, it's kind of ironic, in my view, um, that uh, uh, Washington itself is actually engaged in this heavy state aid uh, uh, um, uh, practices. State, right? yeah. yeah, practices. And, uh, you know, they call China distortionary, mercantile trade practices. Right. But if you look at what Washington is doing today, uh, it's copying everything on that page. So. <laughs> doing the same, right? Uh, Daniel, tell us, you know, the, the European countries, it seems the EU, uh, partly because of the Ukraine conflict, I guess, uh, they are under severe pressure, you know, energy crisis uh, and also national security. Uh, they, they are also facing the competition, for example, not only from other countries, but also from their so-called allies, Washington, uh, for example. Washington is trying to attract uh, the industries away from European countries. Now, you know, they face, a, a, you know, a, probably a, a real scenario of deindustrialization. I mean, how likely is that? Well, you know, the European community uh, is facing an intellectual crisis of uh, putting their money where their mouth is, you know, their commitment to climate change, their commitment to, um, you, know, uh, you know, more social safeguards and so on, um, it costs money. Uh, if you see the Canadians, they are doing precisely what the Europeans are doing, but they can afford it because uh, right now, you know, all the oil money is, you know, paying the bills in Canada. 
So what the Europeans need to do uh, is to create new industries out of the old. Uh, the industries that were pillars of the European economy, the automobile industry, for example, that's in shambles at the moment. Uh, you know, and so they, they are really uh, needing to get out of the hole uh, in terms of um, discovering uh, new headwinds or new, uh, rather new tailwinds that can push the, the, uh, the economy up. Um, part of the solution appears to be in the EU's relationship with China. Um, because uh, if you look uh, at a number of their major corporations, the profitability right now comes from the business that is in China that has taken the last 30 years to build. Um, you know, and uh, I think that we might find some answers in that way, uh, in, the, in that part of the equation. Um, and especially in the area of EV, uh, if the Europeans can get up to EV as quickly as possible, uh, I think that uh, that will provide um, you know, some impetus uh, for recovery of, of the European economy as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, well, John, staying on the, uh, the uh, you know, EU-US relationship, but, you know, recently we have this revolution by a respected US journalist that the US is behind the subtouch of the Nord Stream pipelines. Will that have any impact on the uh, uh, relationship between Washington and Brussels? Whether it's credible or not, it's up to, uh, it's up to uh, a debate. But I think at the end of the day, um, at least I think there is a solid evidence of the United States' motivation to quote Joe Biden's word, to put um, a, a Nord Stream to an end. That's what he said, right? Um, and also uh, the, the current uh, Assistant Secretary of State, uh, uh, Victoria Nuland said that uh, you know, if, if Russia invades Ukraine, we will not let uh, Nord Stream uh, to move forward. I mean, I'm quoting their words. So they have a motivation, but actually, whether they did us or not, uh, we don't know yet. We don't have a solid evidence. But I think, you know, in the heart of the Europeans, they understand this issue, right? They understand, you know, uh, there might be a strong probability that the United States is probably involved. And that raises an amazing issue here. You know, we know about the NATO Article 5, right? NATO Article 5. Right. In the event a, a NATO country is under attack, all NATO members should join together and fight back. Now, this is a potentially a story about NATO attacking NATO. You know, what are we going to do with that? So, um, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting question, uh, mm -hmm. even though the European politicians are not talking about this in public. But I think in their heart, um, they, they understand, um, you know, there's the potential a possibility that the United States is going to be in, is, is indeed was indeed involved, right. and, and and that's going to be a that's going to be a huge blow to their to their to their mind. I think uh, that uh, uh, something can be done uh, of this nature. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, we're talking about uh, German companies being sabotaged. We're talking about French companies being sabotaged, uh, Dutch companies being sabotaged. They are all core NATO members. And how do you right. deal with that? And it's right. a, it's a horrible horrible scenario. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a nightmare for the European politicians to fathom. Right. Uh, Daniel, uh, what's your take on that? You know, the, the U.S. has a motive and also U.S. probably is, uh, I mean, if there's any country with such kind of capability, U.S. Iran, is this country. Iran, Guatemala, you know, uh, Chile. You just keep going, uh, you know. Uh, this story is so um, common now that uh, even if it was not a true story, um, you know, the, you know it's a, the effect of what happened uh, in, in the pipeline uh, is exactly what the U.S. wants. So let's just uh, put it that way. Um, you know, and, and as John mentioned, it does have military repercussions. Uh, you know, NATO's uh, alliance uh, is based on the, the trustworthiness of its members. Uh, but beyond that, uh, you know, if, if the U.S. continues to conduct itself in this way, uh, it's no longer the 1950s and 60s anymore. Um, you know, their partners uh, are, you know, are as mature as they are. Uh, the evidence is out there. Uh, there comes a point at which uh, it has to, um, you know, it has to come to terms with its responsibilities. Um, you know, and we cannot accept, um, you know, any country um, uh, behaving unilaterally in that way. Um, you know, and I think that what's happening today is that the U.S. is coming to a realization uh, that it doesn't have uh, the, the geopolitical uh, dominance that it once had before. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note, we conclude today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGTN app on our YouTube. I'm Xu Qinduo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.